We're continuing uh, in this Ephesians series. It's a short little passage. I'm going to read it. I don't think that I've read the whole thing. Uh, there's not a lot to it. Chapter 4, Ephesians 4, 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Don't give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands so that they may have something to share with those in need. Don't let any, any, any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, ga- Christ God forgave you. I read that whole thing, and I hope that you hear the, the type of language that's within it, which is very instructive. Be like this, and do this, and don't, don't do that, and act like this, and make sure that you're like this. And for many, that's the, that's the whole Christian experience. It's just... I've decided to become a Christian and accept these do's and don'ts. I need to act like this, and I've got to stop acting like this. If I want to be a Christian, what am I allowed to do? I'm allowed to do this? Okay. Well, am I allowed to do that? No. Well, wait a minute. Some Christians say that I am, and some say that I'm not. I guess I have to be with this group. Uh, The Christians that allow me to do that thing or don't allow me to do that thing. And over time, the entire Christian faith just becomes a list of do's and don'ts. What we've done in this is root it in old self and new self. I'm going to bring up a sad topic. Mostly I'm the only one that's sad about it. I owned a truck once. It's weird to laugh. I just said I'm sad about it. I'm sorry. Oh, this was a good truck. She's pretty. It was a four-wheel drive. What happened is the frame was, it was a channel like this, but it was like that. So it was like a channel. And uh, this was a problem because the water could get in that channel and just stay there. It couldn't, ha- didn't have anywhere to go. So over the years, uh, all of the vehicles that were built like this would hold water in that, in that uh, channel and it would rust from that side. So even if you were to take it to a mechanic or take a mechanic with you or look real careful, you look underneath and it looks totally fine. The bottom looks brand new. What you can't see is that it was rotting from the other side. And so a lot of these vehicles that were built that way, uh, as I was told, you can drive it, you better not get hit from behind because it'll just crinkle. That's the old self and the new self. The old self wants to look totally fine, but rotting from the inside. And we felt that in the old self. We felt this feeling of like, I, I'm, I'm able to put on, I'm able to kind of act a certain way, I'm, I'm, I'm moving along in life, but there's just something inside of me that I, I think if I got too much pressure, I would fold in on myself. That's the old self. And the new self is really the death of the old self and its life in Christ. It's saying that the place that I'm searching for answers is different now. The thing that's inside of me that is the life is a different life. And that's the place I'm making my decisions from. And in fact, the way that I carry myself is a natural expression of an internal reality. So I'm a new person just behaving that way. That's where all these kind of instructions come from. It's not, it's not just come into church and find out the rules and then you do's and don'ts and here's all the ways that you need to act like a Christian. That's pretty easy to do that. It's not transformative. It's not going to save anybody. It's just a different way of living life. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about the old self doesn't work. The old self takes you to death. The new self, life in Christ, it makes you different by your very uh, being and you want to do new things. But here's the reality. If you did old stuff for 25 years, you don't just magically know when you become a Christian how to do it a new way. 
And so Paul is teaching one concept at a time that yes, yes, there's a new life within you, but maybe you need a little bit of coaxing and instruction on how to live in that new life. You can't just drum it up. You can't just make yourself be a Christian. You are made Christian by a divine interaction in your life. But once that happens, how do you live that out? And we're moving through one at a time. Today we're talking about stealing. Ephesians 4.28. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. First question. How should we think about stealing? The moment that I said stealing or that today's about stealing or I read stealing in here, I can tell you what we thought of. The eighth commandment. Thou shalt not steal. I did one time. I was a little kid and I was walking with my mom in the grocery store and she wasn't looking and I got a Snickers. And she saw me carrying it around. I don't even know if I was outside the grocery store yet. She, she, she could just see that I had taken it and I wasn't being upfront about it. I didn't put it in the cart. I didn't ask her. I was probably holding it like this. But kind of mom that I have, I had to go and tell a cashier that I had taken this and give it back. So that's the eighth commandment. Thou shalt not steal. And what we do is we define stealing as taking something that doesn't belong to me. I think that there's a little bit more to that. I think there's a little bit more to stealing than just taking what doesn't belong to me. Think about the two two of the most famous stealing stories in the Bible. Achan. Achan's sin. So... The Israelites have defeated this great army and the whole purpose is to cleanse, to cleanse, to cleanse. All of this that you see in the Old Testament about fighting and leaving nothing there is supposed to speak sanctification to us. It's about cleansing everything. Leave nothing in your life that that shouldn't be there. And so God says to them, after you have won the battle, take nothing. So... That's what they thought that they did. They thought that they won the battle and they took nothing. But when they went to try to fight another battle, they are losing. And so Joshua goes before the Lord and he's like, why are we losing? And he says, you might want to find out if anybody took something from the last battle. So they go through this process and sure enough, they figure out that one man took something that he wasn't supposed to take. And uh, he, he died for that. Then we have what sounds like an Old Testament story that accidentally got put in the New Testament in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. You ever, you ever drive past something and you thought you saw something that was weird and you turn real quick and hurt your neck? That's what that story feels like. It's like, did I really just read that in the New Testament? Everyone was sharing everything. That's the end of Acts chapter 4. Everybody's sharing everything. And then there's immediate follow-up story of Ananias and Sapphira who didn't share everything. Now, these are two very potent stories about stealing, but both of them are about community. They're not necessarily about someone taking something from someone else. That's how we've interpreted it. That's the eighth commandment, is that that's your thing, and when you're not paying attention, I'm going to steal it from you. These are two very memorable, very potent stories about stealing that are actually more about community. What is biblical stealing then? There's a massive paradigm shift in salvation from me to we. There is a massive paradigm shift in salvation from me 
to we, from I to us. Where do I come from? Where does my identity come from? And when you're saved, you're not saved for you. You're saved for us. You are saved into a group of people, into a body, and your beginning is your belonging. Where do I begin? Where's my identity? Well, it's in a group. And if we don't understand that fundamental paradigm shift, then biblical stealing, as Paul is referring to it, isn't going to make a whole lot of sense. Because our view of stealing is really an individualistic stealing. Your stuff is yours and my stuff is mine. And so to steal is to take what is yours and make it mine. But biblical stealing comes out of a biblical concept of community, which is that I am a part of us. Therefore, we have belongings. Notice what happens naturally as the church in Acts is formed. More and more and more, they just act in community with one another. Twice, we see a great, powerful description of the church that says that they shared everything. And so that's at the core of what we're talking about today. I've I've mentioned this before. We saw this in Uganda, which is a much more collectivistic culture. I have a shovel here that belongs to me. I picked it out, and I used my money, and I purchased it, and I stored it in my garage, but my Ugandan friend came up and said, may I use our shovel? And I thought, it's not our shovel, which felt a little intrusive, but it felt beautiful when people would come to our house and ask, how is our little girl? Now that feels wonderful. Seeing ourselves as a tight community that God is bringing together and expecting some sharing, significant sharing of resources is really the foundational level of understanding what Paul is talking about here when he refers to stealing. The old self is for the self. The new self is for the body. And this matters in today's sermon. Look at the shift here from steal to share. It's right in the text. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer. Well, how, what's the opposite of that? The opposite is to share. So here's our definition for stealing. Stealing is taking what does not belong to me or keeping what belongs to us. Major question there, who is us? All right, so we're going to go through four different ideas. We're playing through that same definition over and over. Stealing is taking what doesn't belong to me or keeping what belongs to us. And we'll just play through four different resources that you may have in your life. And we're going to start with the one that you think that I'm going to start with, money. (laughs) Mark 10, man comes to Jesus and he's done everything. He's fulfilled the entire law perfectly. And Jesus asks him a question or it gives him a prompt. You've done everything well, but if you want to be perfect, go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. And that, to that, the man left Jesus sad. And there's another teaching where Jesus notices two different people putting money in the offering. And there's wealthy people putting in a lot. And then there's a widow that just puts in one penny. And to that person, he says, she gave more. Now, how? How how do these two stories relate to each other? And what is it that Scripture's trying to tell us? That money's about the heart. Open Open your Bibles to Luke 10. We're actually going to be, it's worth your time to go find it because we're going to be in Luke 10 for the entire sermon. In Luke 10, let's start in verse 4. I'll give you a little backup here. This is where Jesus is sending out 72 disciples to go out to the different cities and make disciples. It's the first time that he's done this. He gives them authority and responsibility and expectation, and and he even teaches them how to do it. But in teaching them how to do it, he tells them, do not take a purse or bag or sandals. Now that seems a little bit strange. The reason Jesus is doing this is because he, he knows that if they have a purse, a bag, and sandals, and they're going from city to city, they could end up looking like merchants. Like they're going there to sell things or to do something in commerce. And he doesn't want any mistake 
that his disciples are going into the city to make disciples and that money has anything to do with it. So he's saying to them, you don't need money. I don't even want you to look like you're talking about money. You're only going to talk about discipleship and uh, anything that you need, it's going to be provided for you. Money has nothing to do with this. Matthew 6, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is a comparing storing things up versus giving to God's will. We don't need to store things up. What does the Bible say about the stuff that we store up? Moths are going to eat it. It's going to rust and it's going to rot. But giving money into things which are God's will, that's a shift in the heart. I want us to remember that any language in Scripture about money is not about money. It's about heart. a quick budgeting exercise. Sit down. If you are uh, taking care of a budget yourself, sit down yourself with your budget. If you're married, sitting down with a spouse, sit down with your spouse with a budget and ask this question. What story does our budget tell? And what story do we want it to tell? Money's not just about money. It's about heart. And, and the new self within you belongs to a group of people. So the story that your budget should be telling is a story about a group of people more than about storing things up. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because I don't want us to think that this is a sermon about money. Anytime that you hear stealing, money is probably the first thing that your brain goes to, so I want to spend more time on other things. We're talking about money. We're actually talking about blessing. Stay in Luke 10. Move down to verse 23. So he's taught them, here's what you need to do. I want you to go to the different towns. And Jesus gets so excited about this, he starts praying and he's full of the Holy Spirit. And then it says in verse 23, Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it. To hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. What are the blessings that Jesus has given to you? What are the unique things that he's put into your life? Now, maybe you went through something. Maybe you went through a really difficult season. You came out on the other side, and Jesus was faithful not to waste your time, but he let you see something. Blessed are you who saw what you saw. And so now you have that blessing in hand. Every blessing God has ever given to man comes with the expectation of multiplication. The question is not whether Jesus is putting blessing into your life. It's whether you are allowing him to multiply it. Jade and I are watching a documentary right now and uh, Tim Tebow is a little part of it. And he was telling this story. That really, the documentary was just trying to dig into where did this guy come from? They make him out to be weird because there's, there's even this amazing little moment where I, I got chills and his teammates are talking about being out partying and doing all of this stuff. And eventually they just quit inviting Tim and, and one, at one point, the teammate said, anytime I saw him, he was either in the Bible or the playbook, so he wasn't coming to party. Man, that's, that's awesome. So they're talking there about, to Tim about just where did this grit and determination come from? And he started talking about his mother. And he said, and he said you know, my, my birth was shaky, and my, my early years were shaky, and she was calling me a miracle child. And so as I, as I grew up, you know, my mother is just saying to me, you're going to do incredible things. You can do anything you want to do. And she would just say this to me all the time. You can do anything that you want to do. You can do anything that you want to do. And, you know, for a while, that's just something that you hear. But then he said this, when you hear it long enough, you start to believe it. 
The blessing of an overflowing mother then flowed into a son who now flows into the entire country. And Night to Shine exists, I believe, in large part because God was allowed to use Tim's mother to pour into the son who pours into greater things. God has poured things into your life, and it could be that just repeating the thing he's blessed you with will allow it to be multiplied larger than the original moment. His little blessings want to become great blessings. He just needs access to you. Are you going to repeat the great blessing that has happened in your life? Where has Jesus blessed you in your life, and where is that being multiplied? I've had people in my life who over, they have been blessed with empathy, and I've gotten empathetic phone calls. People in my life who are blessed with prophetic word, and I've been blessed with prophetic text messages that I save as a note so I can go back and look at it. People in my life who are blessed with discerning ears and wisdom, who have come and sat on my porch and listened carefully and discerned for me. Jesus has blessed you with all kinds of things, and maybe you've downplayed them, maybe you've put water on that fire, but you still have them. God's used every moment of your life to pour blessing in. After the blessing, he just asked for an opportunity to multiply it. God will give you unique blessings, and every single time he's going to give you an opportunity to share the blessings. Let's talk about love. Notice that the, the Luke 10 then moves to the story of the Good Samaritan. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place, he saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He saw the man, he passed by. Saw him pass by. Notice that Jesus explains all three times that the man was seen. The, pre the priest didn't not see him and then walk around. He saw him and then walked by. And the Levite, the same thing. He saw him and he walked by. But the Good Samaritan saw him and did something else. Now here's the great question. I think that the easy, cheap way to read the story is that the priest and the Levite were hateful, bitter, angry people who couldn't love. But I believe, hang with me, that the priest and the Levite had a lot of love and didn't aim it correctly. I don't think that it was a problem with them not being able to love. I think it was a problem of how they used their love. They saw the man, they just didn't do anything. To steal love is to be selfishly selective rather than allowing God to work through us freely. What if loving people chose poorly? Isn't that an interesting twist on the story? Now maybe it wasn't about their failure to love, it was about their allocation of love. It wasn't that they couldn't love people, it was that they were choosing who to love. This is one of my favorite things about Jade. That when we go to places and she sees someone that I have not seen, she goes to that person. Often this is a young mother. And often they have a toddler. And often it's in the grocery store. And often that toddler doesn't want to be in the grocery store. <laughs> and so Jade goes to the mother and says, you're doing a great job, mom. Now that's just about seeing what's in front of you and pouring the love out to that person. Change the person's day.
Romans 12, love must be sincere. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Who aren't you loving? Each one of us. Now remember, there's cheap ways to read Scripture. Cheap way to read the Good Samaritan. I'm the Good Samaritan. And there's people who won't love who I will love. Well, that's easy. What's a better way to read it? I can be a priest sometimes. And there's people that are tough for me to love. That if I walk by, it's easier for me just not to look. Lord, Holy Spirit, help me to see and help me to love. There are moments when the Holy Spirit will prompt you to love with action. Position yourself now to say yes. So don't steal money. Share the money. Don't steal the blessing. God didn't just bless you in your life so that you could be blessed. He blessed you to bless. And don't steal the love. God fills you with love so that he can use that love in, in every area of your life. Who does God want you to love? How does he want you to love? How much love should be poured into other people? What would it look like to love them? How do you define love for that person? God has detailed ideas for the answers to all those questions and wants to do that through your life. So don't steal it. Allow God to use it. Lastly, time. Let's talk about time. Staying in Luke 10. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, I'm in verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, they came to a village where a woman named Martha had opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he had said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen what is better. I want to say just a strange thing I have noticed about Martha. I think that our culture has such an obsession with work, 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 that in my life, I've heard more people say, well, I'm just kind of a Martha, I guess. Almost like that's a, you want applauded for that. Like I work hard and, you know, I, I get caught up in my Martha sometimes. We're called, we have to be Mary's. We have to be people who are spending time in places that cannot be taken away from us. What's the point? Jesus is saying, Martha, you cleaned a lot of dishes that are going to get dirty again. You, you washed a house that's going to get filthy again. You, you kept up a place that's going to become unkept. But every second, every millisecond that Mary is spending in this way is given to her for keeping. There's things that we need to be doing with our time that may not be respected because they don't look like work. Are you, are you willing or interested in appearing to be working less because you're spending your time in ways that can never be stolen from you, can never be taken? If you want to elevate your time, start calling it priority. It's not asking myself, what did I do today? I ask myself, what did I prioritize today? If you have a journal, put at the bottom section, what did I prioritize today? That's a faith step forward. 
my grandma Alberta. I've thought about this many times. I was working at an office job, an eight to five, and I had this idea to write a book, and I know that my grandma Alberta has written many books. And I gave her this idea for a book, and for me, it was really a Martha thing. It was, I want to have done this in my life. I, I think that I can. I have an idea. I, I want to write a book, and my grandma can help me. So I'm going to invite her, and we're going to create a partnership here. And she came to my office on a regular schedule, met me down in the break room, brought me lunch, sat there, and I only recently realized, this has been 15 years ago, that I was giving Martha time and she was giving Mary time. This had nothing to do with the book. It had everything to do with her grandson. She was coming to spend time with me. She wanted to be the kind of grandma that just said over and over, you can do it, Nathan. You can do it, Nathan. You can do it, Nathan. So many times that I might start to believe it. And my grandma has passed away years ago now, and I still remember her Mary investment. I don't think I have a copy of the book. I've lost the book. I have not lost her Mary investment in my life. Where are you giving time? Not effort and tedious work and making sure everything is organized together, but sitting down face-to-face -face investment. The world is going to offer you hours and hours of time investment. And Jesus in your life wants to have a, a period where he can see that you're working and put a period at the end of that sentence and start you on something new. What do I mean by that? If you're mopping the floor, mop it to the very best of your ability unless someone comes into your space who needs your attention and then set the mop down and make tea and sit and spend time. There are places where Jesus wants us to invest our time that may not look like work because at the end of the day, you only mopped half the floor, but you invested in a life. That's the point that Jesus is making to Mary and Martha. We give our time to our priorities. What are your priorities? So here we have four different resources, and there are others. If I had expanded this and I could fit how to make eight, no problem, we have eight. What if I could have 800? No, there's still 800. Your life is jam-packed full of resources, and all of those resources sit on one foundation, that you are us and that God wants to use every resource at your fingertips to pour into the kingdom community. So maybe there's one I didn't list and that's the one that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about now. But that's the closing thought. What resource, what unique resource, maybe it's your education, maybe it's just a natural personality that you have, Maybe it's a gift or a skill that you developed early on. Maybe it's that you're at a new place in life and you've got a ton of time that you didn't used to have. Jesus is pouring resources into your life. And stealing seems like a really harsh word. Let's focus on sharing. What resource has God poured into your life and he also wants you to share it? Lord, we thank you for speaking to us today. We thank you for pouring such great blessings into our lives. We thank you that you haven't left us out on our own, but you've called us into a great community of believers, at times called an army. We ask this morning that if there are resources that you've poured into our lives, not just money, but just anything, anything that's of value and of use to the kingdom and to the body of Jesus Christ, anything that could be helpful to the bride, Lord, we ask that you would point to that thing and tell us how to use it. Give us creative ideas. Show us how we can reinvest. We love you. Amen.